Let's turn quickly to two passages of Scripture. Matthew chapter 23, verse number 19. Exodus chapter 29, verse number 37. Matthew chapter 23, verse number 19. Boy, they sang uh, what I'm going to try to preach tonight. And uh, I just, I just want to have things deposited in eternity. As much as I'm thankful for everything that this world has to offer, I want to make deposits in eternal things. Matthew chapter 23, verse number 19, the Bible says, Ye fools and blind, referring to the Pharisees. For whether is greater or what is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? What's greater, the gift or the altar? Exodus chapter 29, verse number 37. Seven days thou shalt make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it. And it shall be an holy altar, most, most holy. That whatsoever toucheth the altar, if it makes contact with the altar, it will be holy. It matters where you put your sacrifice. It matters where you put your sacrifice. So I want to preach to you tonight simply on this subject, the place of sacrifice. The place matters, church. Would you lift your hands one more time all over this house? And would you truly lift your voice? And would you ask that God would have his will and his way in this service? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what I feel in this house. I thank you for the weight of eternity that is in the world today, God. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I simply ask God that you would anoint me and you would use me for your glory. You've given me a word. Help me to deliver it, Lord, with your ability. Loose the gifts of the Spirit into this atmosphere and confirm this word with signs following in the wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus. If you believe God's going to speak to you tonight, if you've got an open heart for the word of the Lord for you tonight, would you just lift your voice one more time and love the Lord? Amen. Amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. It would appear that every time I get behind a pulpit lately that the Lord has quicken me to remind God's people that there are two worlds, the natural and the supernatural. And I need to remind this wonderful church tonight that the eternal things are the things that matter. And there is truly a ploy of the enemy in the hour that we are living in to see things in the natural. But I'm here to remind you that the natural merely reflects the supernatural. If Israel is in battle and war in the natural, the church is at war in the supernatural. And we must remember that the things of eternity for the church, those are the things that matter. I realize that we are in the world right now, but we are not of the world. I realize that we here today have zip codes and we have addresses that place us in the United States and wherever you live. However, that is not your forever dwelling place. And if you do not see the rapture, friend, and I think many of us alive today are going to see the rapture. If you do see the grave, that is not your final place. But there is a place beyond the grave. There is a moment, a twinkling of an eye, where the dead in Christ shall rise first. And I need to remind you that we must look to the Bible as it tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 and 18 that we are not to look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen, those are eternal things. 
in the natural, you can't see them, but in the supernatural, it's real and it's there and it's moving. We must remember that John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. That the purpose of God manifesting himself in flesh, the purpose of God coming to us and headed to Calvary's cross was so that you and I could have a place in eternity with him. First John teaches us in First John 2, 24, let them therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning and that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you and also shall continue in the Son and the Son in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. There is a promise of eternity. There is a reality of a life beyond this life. Uh, you will spend eternity somewhere. I know that we are in a world that wants to keep us in the here and in the now. But we are not living for the here and now. We are living for the there and then. 1 Corinthians 15, 40, 44, pardon me while I read a few verses of scripture. It says, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. That's Jesus. Howbeit that which was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are the they that are earthy and as is the heavenly such are they that are heavenly and as we having borne the image of the earthly we shall also bear the image of the heavenly now this I say brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God neither doth corruption inherit incorruption but I will show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall we be brought to pass saying that it is written death is swallowed up in victory O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye have known that your labor is not in vain. There is a lie that wants to tell you reading the Bible's in vain. There is a lie that wants to tell you coming to church is vanity. There is a lie that wants to tell you giving and tithes and offering, it's a waste. Uh, there is a lie that wants to tell you doing what the Bible says do, uh, it is vain. There is a lie that wants to tell you praying uh, and fasting, it's vain. But I've come today to tell you, it is not in vain, friend. There will be a moment. Uh, you're not sowing in the natural. You're sowing in the supernatural. And if you don't see a reward, here. Uh, there is a reward uh, that is beyond the clouds, that is beyond the blue sky, that is beyond the starry night. Oh, I want to see him, the look upon his face. Uh, I can't wait to get to heaven. Ooh. That's why the apostle Paul said in Galatians 6 and 7, when he was writing to that church, he said, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall reap of the flesh corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall reap spirit. Uh, something that is spiritual shall reap the spirit of life everlasting. He's talking about eternal things. 
Listen, he's talking about eternity. And then he says, and let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, you shall reap if you faint not. Could it be that he was referring not to the here and now, but that he was saying to the there and then? Could it be that you and I may never see the reaping of what we sow here on earth? I've made up in my mind, if I never see it here on earth, as long as I get to heaven. Hebrews 11 gives a whole list of people that saw all of these amazing things. And then it says there are others which did not receive the promise here on earth. But friend, they are up in heaven as a great cloud of witnesses tonight saying, come on, don't stop. You may not get it here. Don't faint. If you can make it there, friend, there is a reward beyond the sky. I know that we are a generation that likes instant gratification and instant returns. Uh, Sometimes we don't like the investment that doesn't show up immediately. Uh, Sometimes it's a long time investment. Sometimes it's compounding interest. Uh, Sometimes it's just a little bit uh, and a little bit uh, and a little bit. And that little bit, next thing you know, is a lot, friend. That's kind of what living for the Lord is like. Uh, You may not see all the goodness right now, uh, but if you can just hold on uh, until that trump sounds. My, my, my. That's why Jesus did not ask us, but he commanded us in Matthew 6 and 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. For where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Ah, treasures in heaven. For neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through or steal. He says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. (laughs) I want to remind you today that there are things that you are sowing into that is not natural, but it is supernatural. And where your treasure is, where your treasure is, where your treasure is, Where's your heart at here tonight? Are you already thinking about what's going to happen after the service? Hear me. I know that this is convicting tonight, and I would prefer to preach faith, but I've got to do what the Lord said do here tonight. Where's our heart in this thing? Why is it that if preacher preaches longer than 30 minutes, we check out where's our heart in this thing? Why is it that if the altar lasts longer than our our lunch reservation, we begin to leave where's our heart at? Uh, Because we've got to learn, friend, you're not sowing in the natural. uh, You're sowing in the supernatural. uh, And if you'll invest your time in spiritual things, uh, there will be a time where there is no more time, uh, where we're up in heaven, uh, where there's no more setting of the S-U-N, but There is the S-O-N, and there's always light, and there's always shouting. My, 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 my. How sad is it that we determine the quality of a service by whether there is no preaching or not? Boy, we had good church. There wasn't any preaching. Uh, We are saved by the foolishness of... Preach, preacher. Preach, preacher. You see, there are different levels of sacrifice that we read in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 5, verse number 7, it begins to talk to us that says, If you're not able to bring a lamb, then he shall bring for his trespass, which he hath committed two turtle doves or two young pigeons unto the Lord, one for sin offering, another for the burnt offering. Verse 11 says, But if he's not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he that sin shall bring for his offering the tenth part of an ephah of flour for a sin offering. He shall put oil upon it, neither shall he put any frankincense thereon, for it is a sin offering. He said, if you can't afford a lamb, you better get a dove or a pigeon. If you can't afford a dove or a pigeon, you better get some grain. Why was he saying that? He said, because it doesn't matter what level you are at in this. It doesn't matter what economic status you are at or at what point of discipleship you are at. There should always be a desire to put something on the altar. 
there should always be a desire to lay something down in the kingdom. Well, I can't afford to give what they can give, but do you have a dove? Well, I can't afford a dove, but do you have some grain? Friend, you've got to learn how to sacrifice. Can I preach to a young person here today? Well, I can't give as much as mom and daddy gives, but you can give something. Young person, young adult, young married, well, I'm saving for a house and I'm putting back for a new car. I can't give what the elder can give, but you can give something. And I want to preach to you today, when you sow into eternity, you will reap eternal things. I'm not interested in reaping in the natural. Ah. Oh God, I'm looking for the supernatural. Hear me today. I believe, I believe, I believe in putting money into high yield savings accounts. You better do it. But one day you're going to die and that money will not be there for you anymore. I believe in investing into retirement funds that have compounding interest so that you can retire and have a good chunk in the bank. But friend, when you die, you will not take that retirement fund with you. I believe in having a nice car. I think we, the Pentecostal church, should have the best of the best. Uh, but when you die, you're not taking the car with you. Uh, I believe we ought to live in nice homes. But friend, when you die, uh, your homes are not going with you. Uh, I believe we ought to present ourselves as the best as we can. Uh, we ought to dress nice unto the Lord. Uh, but friend, when you die, uh, you're not taking the suit with you, uh, nor the dress with you, uh, nor the purse with you. Uh, nor the shoes with you. I like electronics, but my MacBook isn't going to make it to heaven. My iPad isn't going to make it to heaven. My iPhone isn't going to make it to heaven. I've got news for you. When you get up out of here, all of this will become dust, rust, and moth food. So we must learn. We must learn. To forsake the present world. Paul wrote to Timothy as a warning. He said, Demoth hath forsaken me. He hath loving this present world. He's not worthy of the missionary trips anymore. He's not worthy to travel with the apostle anymore. He loves the present world too much. And there is a ploy from the adversary to want us to love temporal things more than he eternal things. Oh, when we give, we get frustrated because the gift uh, takes away from the here and now, but it's sowing into the there and then. When we submit our talents, we get frustrated because uh, it takes practice to sharpen our talent, uh, but you're not sowing in the here and now. You're investing in the there and then. Uh, come on, somebody. Uh, I'm not worried about here and now. Uh, I may never be the most popular. Uh, I may never be the most famous. Uh, I may never be the best preacher, the best singer. Uh, I may never be the best of anything, but you better believe uh, I am putting treasure in heaven. So we ask ourselves, what makes the sacrifice holy? What makes a bull holy? What makes a goat holy? What makes a dove or a pigeon or grain holy? There's fields of grain endless. There was more than one spotless lamb that could be offered. There was more than one perfect bull that could be sacrificed. There was more goats than were offered. There was more doves than were offered. There was more pigeons than were offered. They were plenteous. They had men that specialized in raising that which could be sacrificed. So why is the sacrifice special? It's because of the place you invest it. You fools are blind, he said to the Pharisees. What's greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Uh, Exodus teaches us that whatever touches the altar, if it ever comes in contact with the altar... It doesn't matter if it comes in contact with the things of the world. But if it touches the altar, 
if you put it in the right place. Don't misunderstand what I'm preaching. I told you I believe. We have a pastor that teaches us good financial principles. You better do what's right. You better be right. Yes, yes, yes. That's not what I'm preaching. But I'm telling a young person here today, you better learn where to put your sacrifice. I'm telling some young marrieds here, you better learn where to place the sacrifice. I'm telling some parents here, you better learn where to place the sacrifice. I wish some elders that have been doing this for a long time would testify. When you put it in the right place. The moment it touches the altar. It shifts from temporal to eternal. It's just 10%. Why is a tithe important? Well, it all belongs to the Lord. That's why, first of all. But when I give him 10th back of what's already his, the 90 becomes holy. You didn't hear what I just said. God will do more with the 90 than you'll ever do with 100. Well, I don't understand. I don't understand why, why, why I have to give of my time, why I have to volunteer at the church, why I have to submit my life uh, to the things of God. Because when you give God the little bit, you're going to have a testimony like these elders that are here. When you sow your time into the kingdom, I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed out begging bread. I was young. I was young, but now I'm old. David said, I'm looking back. And because I put it in the right place and I laid it on the right altar, that which was temporal became eternal. My, my, my. Friend, can I tell you, when you learn what to do with your sacrifice, eternal things begin to move on your behalf. It is not the gift that makes the altar holy. And let me tell you, I've been in this long enough, and I've sat across from enough people that say, boy, do you know how much I give to that church? Like it's their money that makes the church valuable. I've sat across from people that say, boy, do you know how much time I give to that church? Like it's their time that makes the kingdom of God go forward. I've sat across from people that say, boy, if they didn't have me, that whole system would fall apart. That whole department would crumble. Friend, let me tell you something. It was never your gift that made this place holy. It was this holy place that made your gift. And because you had somebody that told you, you better put your talent in the right place. You better learn the principle of sowing into the kingdom. That's why you're blessed. That's why you're where you're at. You didn't make this place great. This place made you. You better believe I'll give this church my time. You better believe I'll give this kingdom my youth. You better believe I'll sow my finances and my energy and my resources. Because if it wasn't for an altar, if it wasn't for an altar, where would I be? Oh, come on, lift your hands and let's worship the Lord right now. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. I began to think about the parable that pastor brought out this morning. The parable of the talents, the giving of the talents. Something jumped out at me. He said, this is about the kingdom of heaven. He said, this is not temporal things. I'm not talking about natural things. I'm talking about kingdom things. I'm talking about spiritual things. He said, I gave you talents for the kingdom. You didn't hear what I just said. 
I'm gifted. I'm, I'm, I'm anointed. No, 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 no. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father above. And he gives you those gifts. And he says these talents are according to the kingdom of heaven. And one man sowed it into the earth. That which man came from, earth, flesh, carnality. He said, I'm going to take kingdom things and turn it into the natural. And when you start taking kingdom things and putting it into the natural, you begin to stop seeing God the way he always intended for you to see. And then cynicism begins to be birthed in your spirit. Bitterness begins to be birthed in your spirit. The I mentality of Lucifer begins to be birthed in your spirit. Because you're taking kingdom things that God gave you for the kingdom. And you're using them for the thing God didn't intend you to use them for. And so you'll start looking at the things of God. You'll start looking at your pastor and God, and you'll say, he's a hard man. I, like he said this morning, I, he's a God sitting up on a throne waiting to get us. Because you're taking spiritual things and you're using them for natural things. You've got the gift that was given and you're sowing it into the things of the world instead of giving first to the things of God. And watch when he comes back. He said, I'm going to take from you and give to you because the gift was never meant for the man. Shoo. The gift was meant for the kingdom. But when man starts thinking, this is for me, how can it make me better? How can it improve me? How can I become better? And doesn't submit it to the kingdom of whence it came. Friend, the Bible teaches us that lest you are holy, you will not see God. And the scripture says only the altar can make us holy. That's why Romans says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Every day, get on the altar and die. Because if you touch the altar, you'll become holy. You have to understand that giftings and callings are without repentance. You can be gifted without an altar. But you cannot be holy without an altar. You can be gifted without an altar. But without an altar, you will not see God. And we are in a world and in a generation that thinks giftings is the premier thing in the kingdom. But giftings are without repentance. Where the altar, that's where you become holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if we ever elevate the gifting above the altar, we will produce a gifted generation, but not a holy generation. I would rather see God then I would impress you with my talent please know my heart I prayed for purity to come from a place of sincerity and I pray tonight there would be some people that will say I would rather walk with the Lord uh, oh God I'll give you whatever you need Lord it came from you anyways I tell you, the Lord is trying to teach some people some principles in this place and in this series with pastor that we've got to get back to the balance of where we put our treasure. I was reminded of the story of Naaman. He comes to the prophet Elisha, a leprous man. And he in his leprous state is commanded 
from the prophet, go down to the river Jordan and dip yourself seven times. He says, would not Abana or Parfar be better as he rides away in frustration? Those are natural springs. <laughs> Abana and Parfar, if you study them out, they are, they are earthly springs. They are springs that, that are sourced in the earth. But Jordan's not an earthly spring. That gets its source from the mountaintops of Lebanon where the snow begins to melt. It has a heavenly source and it begins to come down and it begins to water the plains. And that river, that river is where he says, you've got to go dip seven times. He comes up out of the river the seventh time and he says, boy, I'm new. It's like I'm a babe. He says, it's a type and shadow of new birth. And he comes back to the prophet and he says, let me give you some gifts. And the prophet says, this was never about the gifting. But watch, watch what Naaman requests. If you won't give me a gift, will you let me take some dirt home? Because I'm no longer going to worship my God. I'm going to worship your God. And I learned. I can't worship your God without an altar. And so one of the altars, according to the Bible, is an earth altar. He said, I'm going to take this dirt home and I'm going to build an altar at my home. And I'm going to lay it out and I'm going to set it up. And that's going to be where I worship. I'm going to have an altar because it was never about the gift always about the altar and old Gehazi gets caught up in the temporal think about it he goes running after Naaman he says Naaman 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 listen the prophet changed his mind I'll take the clothes natural I'll take the silver natural and he takes it and he gives it to the two sons of the prophets and they go running back with temporary Shows up back at the prophet's house like nothing happens, not knowing that the prophet's heart went with him. And the prophet looked at him and said, when you went, did you not know that my heart went with you? Do you not know that I went with you? And he looked at him, pastor, and he said, don't you know, it's not yet time. It's not that you won't have it. It's that it's not your time to have it. You're too caught up in the here and now that you lost sight that this was all about a man building an altar. Because if Naaman can build an altar, something can shift in his life. But you were too concerned with the temporal to realize what I was doing in the eternal. Friend, the temporary is going to fade. And when we preach these things, it's like we don't even understand. It's because we lack an altar. A place where motive dies. Agenda dies. Pride dies. Selfishness dies. Ego dies. Where we get up from that altar and we say, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Because if you ever come in contact with an altar, whatever that touches the altar will be made holy. And if you become holy, you will see God. Feel that coming through here right now. There's a weight of eternity trying to talk to somebody. Quit messing with the temporal. Fall back in love with the eternal faith. What about heaven? We've got to get it out of our minds. We are the reason this thing is great. It wasn't for the altar. If 
it had not been for the Lord, if it had not been for a place of death, stand with me all over. I think this altar ought to be full right now. I think somebody's feeling eternity. I think somebody ought to run to this altar and lay some things down. I'm not talking about a pretty altar call where you come and pray your normal prayer. I'm talking about an altar call where the tears run, where the snot runs, where the clothes get messed up. A kind of altar where you are feeling eternity say, lay it all down. Lay it all down, lay it all down, lay it all down. I pray that there's a young person that gets the principle of sowing into eternity. I pray there's a young married couple in this place that gets the principle of it's not about the here and now, it's about the there and then. Come on, the Savior is calling, the Savior is calling, the Savior is calling, the Savior is calling. Can you hear eternity beckoning you? Come on, can you hear eternity beckoning you? Are you willing to do what God says to? Come on, come on, come on. Some of the reason there's so much tension in your life is you're too focused on the natural. You're too focused on the temporary. Come on, let's get an eternal weight upon us today. Let's lay some things down here today. I wish there would be some groanings. I wish there would be some people that would feel the tearing away of the natural and the depositing of the supernatural into this place right now. in houses and land. I surrender all. Come on, lift your hands. There's a surrendering in this house. Oh, I surrender all, Lord. Come on, I hear it. I hear something birthing in some people. I, I hear the shift of viewpoints. I, I feel the change of perception. I surrender all, Lord. Come on, I'm laying it all down in this house. Uh, Hatayala boho shatayala baha. 
yeke yaradolo moho shataye. Oh, atoye la ba ya shataya ya ya. Come on, don't stop, don't stop. The word of the Lord was look unto me. Come on, look unto him. That means get your eyes off of the here and now. Surrender. Come on, I surrender. <laughs> Come on, let the tears stream down your face.
minutes in. Let's worship one more time. Lift your hands all over this house. I tell you, I love Oh Shatan. I want to remind you something here today that the altar, it used to be something physical that you you built on hewn stones or out of the earth. Now that altar can be built anywhere. When you go to work tomorrow, build an altar. When you gather your family around the dinner table, build an altar. When you're in your living room talking, build an altar. When you're driving to work, build an altar. What is an altar? An altar is where things die. An altar is where you put something there that could be sacrificed. Now we worship on spiritual altars. This as beautiful as this is, and we should always come to the physical altar of the church. This represents something spiritual. When you wake up tomorrow, I plead with you, build an altar. If you'll ever become altar-centered, everything just begins to make sense. One more time, would you lift your hands? How would you make a commitment with the Lord tonight? Lord, places that have not had altars before I'm done here, they're going to have altars. Places in my life, God, that have not been laid down upon an altar in a long time. Come on, let the Lord minister to you. Let the Lord speak to you. Let the Lord speak to you. 